the Lord's done anything for you this morning, maybe you'd say amen this morning. If you will, take your copy of God's Word and turn with me over to the New Testament book of Acts. We'll be in Acts chapter 18 this morning. Acts chapter 18, verses 24 through chapter 19, verse 20. Acts chapter 18. When you find uh, Acts chapter, go to Acts chapter 19 for the reading this morning. Verse 11, Acts 19 verse 11. Those that are able, if you'll stand with me in reverence to the reading of God's holy and fallible, His inerrant, His preserved word that we hold in our hands. Acts chapter 19 verse 11. And God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul, so that from his body were brought into the, into the sick handkerchiefs or aprons, and the diseases departed from them, and the evil spirits went out of them. Verse 13, Then certain of the vagabond Jews, exorcists, took upon them to call over to them which had evil spirits the name of the Lord Jesus, in the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, We adjure you by Jesus, grab this, whom Paul preacheth. Verse 14, And there were seven sons of Sceva, a Jew, and a chief of the priest, and which did so, uh, which did so, and the evil spirit, verse 15, and the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know and Paul I know, but who are you? Verse 16, and the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them and overcame them and prevailed against them so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. And this was known to all the Jews and the Greeks also dwelling at Ephesus and fearing uh, and, and fear, fear fell on them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. Father, in the name of Jesus, please help us this morning. God, please help our finiteness this morning, Lord. God, you are infinite, Lord. Father, help us in the name of Jesus. We pray, Holy Ghost, empower us, Lord. God, help us to be what we actually preach against this morning, Lord. Help us not to be deficient in power, but God, fill us with thy power. God, may this be a church, Lord that would manifest the power, the presence, and the gifts of God. Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Well, as I come to you this morning, I've got to first kind of explain this passage, unfortunately, because many people try to misinterpret the Word of God and uh, in a lot of denominations and a lot of other religious organizations, they take the Word of God and build doctrines where the Bible doesn't make a doctrine. So, unfortunately, bear with me for just a minute while I cut through the chase here real quick and level a few things out. First of all, when we look at this passage, we see supernatural working, don't we? We see praying over handkerchiefs and mighty miracles being done. There's something that we need to understand in the Bible, and that is that God manifests through mighty miracles at different times as He pleases throughout the Word of God. We see manifestations of mighty miracles. We see it in Elijah and Elisha's day uh, during the Old Testament. Then at Moses' day when God was doing something mighty and magnificent, fixing to pull the children of Israel out of bondage and press them forward and give the word of God to all of the world through them. He did mighty miracles and mighty works through Moses. Unfortunately, there was 430, 400 years between the Old Testament and the New Testament where God was silent. We don't hear or have any record of during that time and there was a time of silence. 
And then all of a sudden at the New Testament when the gospel, uh, uh, Gospels record, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John record the birth of Jesus, what do we see again? Mighty miracles, mighty wonders, angelic activity all over the place. Then at the New Testament church in the book of Acts, mighty power, mighty moving. God moves as he pleases in mighty ways throughout time. Because he moved in Elijah's day in different times, we do not try to copy those same miracles that they did in that day and time. Now, our God today is a miracle-working God. I've seen people healed. I've seen great miracles done. But we cannot build for doctrine to force to say that someone isn't saved or someone isn't completely right if they're not manifesting the same exact gifts that we saw in the book of Acts. Are y'all with me on that? Just say, be careful and let God have his work when he wants to. Say amen. So when we see the supernatural working of God in, in religious circles, what we need to understand is that there are some people that have high views of the supernatural, and there are some people that have low views of the supernatural. When I say a high view, some are, are out there and have a way high view. They say the supernatural. Boy, I tell you what, God's supernatural and I can walk on water in my pool if I just have faith. Boy, they're way out there, high view of supernatural, right? And then there are those that many times dress in long robes and phylacteries and all that stuff that say God don't even do miracles anymore. We're just here till we die and he takes us to heaven and God's done with the miracles. That's a low view. Where are we? We just in a biblical view say amen right there. Most of the time the biblical view and on anything, the right view is normally in between two arguments in the balance middle. What do we do? We know that God has done, does great supernatural works. We understand today that in the book of James, that uh, by the book of James chapter 5, that if we come together as believers and anoint with oil and pay, pray, pray over the sick, that many of those would be saved. We know that we have great miracles that we can pray out uh, today. But what we need to understand is that some people have high views and some have low views of the supernatural, and therefore that would cause them to interpret this text differently than some would. But we're going to do it right. Say amen there. Boy, I'm digging way too deep this morning. Let's go. When we think about this passage, we've got to ask the questions, are demon spirits real? Some would say no. Some would say absolutely. Well, scripturally, yes, there are demonic activity that still goes on today, and there are still demons today that try to possess those who don't have Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. We could learn that from Legion who was in Luke chapter 8, the man filled with many demons. You could understand it from Mark 5, the boy that was filled with the demon that would cast him into the fire and Jesus healed him. So yes, we understand that demon spirits are still active and real in our day. We could see that in the drug use today, that that is just witchcraft, potions that the devil is using to control the minds of people today. We'd also have to ask the question, not only are demon spirits real, but does God do supernatural works through saints today? Does God do works through us today? Yes, absolutely. He uses us in mighty ways today, sometimes to pray for people. When the Spirit draws us, sometimes we pray and God manifests and moves in a mighty way. He does do supernatural gifts through us today in His own will and way. Again, James chapter 5, anointing with oil and praying. Uh, the next question would be, to what measure does he do those gifts today? Absolutely just what he wants to, when he wants to, and how he wants to. But we do not build doctrines that everybody that's saved has to hold handkerchiefs and pray on them and give it to somebody and they get healed. Do you understand what I'm saying today? Now are you ready to get on to the message now that we cut through all of the chase? Say Hallelujah. Boy, y'all are very spiritual this morning saying hallelujah. This morning on this text, Acts chapter 18, verses 24 through 19, 19, through 19, verse 20, I want to preach on a subject this morning. Something is missing. Something is missing. As we look today at our churches today, we do see many congregations that seem somewhat powerless. If we're not careful, sometimes in our religious traditions, 
and orthodoxy, we can become monotonous and just routine in what we do Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. Pray, we're going to do it like this, and that's it. But friend, I want you to understand that we have the power of heaven this morning to conquer and to war against the blindness and the darkness of the devil. What did, he, what did the Lord say through Paul there in Romans? He said, where sin did abound, grace did much more abound. The work and the spirit of God is so much more powerful than the darkness and the power of the devil. We serve a risen God. We serve a powerful God. We have access to heaven's power this morning in and through Jesus Christ to overpower the works of the devil. But many times we feel powerless, do we not? Many sermons today will just be uh, venting of some man who is tired of whipping sheep who just come out and hang out in the fold every now and then. Sometimes we seem powerless, but friend, what I want to do this morning is to tell you that in many congregations today, there is something missing. We're looking to see the main idea today would be that the flesh cannot produce spiritual works. The flesh alone cannot produce spiritual works. As we look at this passage this morning, I want you to see first point is this. that the, the, Here uh, in the early book of Acts, even this most powerful book where we see in Acts chapter 2, we see the, the birthing forth of the New Testament church. We see the, the ordaining of the New Testament church. We see the ribbing cutting at Acts chapter 2 when Paul preaches and the New Testament church empowered the Holy Spirit Spirit is released and what happens, uh, we see the power of God begin to save people of every kindred, every nation, every tongue. We see God uh, move and we see the releasing of the supernatural working of a holy God. Why? Because preaching is going on and 3,000 people get saved. There's people being touched and being healed. God is moving in a mighty way in the book of Acts. But even in the midst of the book of Acts, by chapter 19 here, we begin to see some deficiency in the power of the New Testament church. Uh, first of all, we see in chapter 18, verse 24 through 28, we see deficiency in preaching. Deficiency in preaching. Look at chapter 18, verse 24. And a certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, an eloquent man uh, and uh, mighty in the scriptures, came to Ephesus. Here we have Apollos who was a great encourager, a great oracle uh, or orator. He was eloquent in his speech. He was nothing like your preacher. He'd have had the right words. He'd have been polished over, boy. He'd have just been so smooth. He'd have had every English word right and correct, but he was an eloquent man in his speech. Look at this, verse 25. This man was instructed in the way of the Lord and being fervent in the Spirit. He was fervent in the Spirit. He spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord, knowing only the baptism of John. Verse 26. And he began to speak boldly. All he in the flesh, he was very bold in what he was saying. In the synagogue, verse 26, whom when Aquila and Priscilla had heard, they took him and took them and expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. Here, Aquila and Priscilla, this husband and wife, Christian team who were well doctrinated in the scriptures, they saw the deficiency in Apollos' preaching. Here Apollos was, he was an eloquent man, he was well spoken, he was well, uh, uh, well uh, spoken in, uh, from what he was teaching, he was teaching boldly, he was teaching truth, but they understood there was something missing in his preaching. And in verse 27, and when he was disposed to pass unto uh, Achai, the brethren wrote exhorting the disciples to receive him, who when he was come, he, what? he helped them which had believed through grace. For he mightily convinced the Jews in that publicly showing this by the scriptures that Jesus was Christ. Do you see how much better he was when the deficiency was seen and met and that deficiency was wiped out? Even though he was a good speaker, even though he was, he was well, well polished, even though he was bold, even though he had the right word and preaching the right message, there was something missing in his preaching and everybody could see it and notice it. Friend, I want you to understand today that what we 
need in our pulpits in America and all across the world in Christian churches today are not just well-polished sermons, not just main points and good stories in the introduction and a great conclusion at the end, but what people need more than just a doctrinally sound uh, Word of God message is they need men of God who have met God in the Holy of Holies that week, who have been prayed up and who have the anointing and the power of God upon them. Don't you understand that we need the fullness of the Holy Spirit to work today because we can copycat and work this thing out in the flesh. But you cannot produce the power of God in the flesh alone. There was deficiency in his preaching. I think much of the day we have deficiency in our preaching of our congregations today. Not only the deficiency, something is missing, the deficiency of preaching, but here in the book of Acts, we see the deficiency of purpose. We see a deficient purpose. You'll see it in chapter 19, verses 1 through 7. Look at verse 1. And it came to pass while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus and finding certain disciples. He said unto them, Have ye received the Holy Ghost since ye believed? Paul Excuse me, Apollos sees here, he sees these disciples who are uh, professing to be Christians. He says, have you got the Holy Ghost? And what did they say? And they said unto him, verse 2, we have not so much as even heard whether there be a Holy Ghost. And he said unto them, unto what then were you baptized? And they said, unto John's baptism. Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto them, the people, that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is on Christ Jesus. Verse 5, when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came upon them, and they spake with tongues or languages and prophesied. And verse 7, and all the men were about twelve. It prophesied. What does that mean? It began to testify about the goodness of God. Some of y'all do that every now and then. I remember the old, uh, many times at my old home church, them old tanks, sometimes a preacher get up to, uh, to preach and somebody would jump up and say, I got something I got to say. Start testifying, prophesying about the Lord. Next thing you know, that thing done run over there, somebody else prophesying. Next thing you know, you turn, the, turn the, uh, the, what was supposed to be a preaching service into an hour-long testimony of everybody in the congregation just prophesying and te- talking about God and what He's done for them. What we see here is deficient purpose in these disciples. They're just walking around. They're wandering around. Paul sees them and he says, hey, have you got the Holy Ghost? Why? Because he knew there was something deficient in them. He had known of his own deficiency and Aquila and Priscilla took him and, and had given him and taught him better and in that he was more active and better uh, equipped to do the work of God because he had found, yea, the, the deep things of God. Now all of a sudden he's to see deficiency in these disciples who have chosen Christ, who have known Christ, but they haven't been baptized unto Christ. They've not fulfilled every obligation of feeling, the, the feeling of, of God's spirit. The first commandment that we have after being believers in Jesus Christ is to be uh, baptized by water. And until we have fully uh, fulfilled God's commandment, God won't use us to greater degrees. So in other words, now you don't receive the the Holy Spirit. You receive the Holy Spirit by faith. When you believe believe God by faith in the works of Jesus Christ, the Bible teaches us that we receive He, the Holy Spirit of God, John chapter 14 and John chapter 16, who teaches us, guides us, directs us. And God tells us to let the whole world know outwardly that you've been saved, that interchange by going down to the river or going into the baptismal pool or going into the pool behind the house and being saved. Uh, being baptized, full submersion, acknowledging to all of the world that you associate with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Friend, can I tell you this morning that if you have not followed through with baptism, that is a very important step in command of the Lord. And friend, I want to tell you, until you get that one right, he's probably not going to give any more orders. But here what we see in this here is that they had John's baptism. You remember that John the Baptist was the forerunner of Jesus Christ. And John was baptizing there in the Jordan. But his baptism was not a baptism unto faith in Jesus Christ. It was a baptism of repentance and cleansing to acknowledge the coming Christ. 
It was a way of preparation for the people to prepare for the coming Messiah. Nonetheless, this here was not the baptism under faith like the Christian church was supposed to receive. And once they were baptized, we see uh, then their purpose changed. Beforehand, verses 2 and 3, they're walking around. We don't even know if there is a Holy Ghost. What are you even talking about? There's no purpose in their life. They're just existing in the faith. But once they had fulfilled the obligation to be baptized unto Jesus Christ, then God gave the Holy Spirit of God to sit down in the spiritual seat. And what happened? They began to prophesy, didn't they? They began to where they had no purpose. Now they have purpose and they're telling about their purpose and all that God did in their hearts. Friend, I want you to understand this morning that there are many uh, Christians today in our walk that are walking around as these were with no purpose in life. Yeah, I'm saved. Yes, I go to church. Where you go? Yeah, I go down to so-and-so church down there at the corner of so-and-so and so-and-so. Yeah? What are you doing for the Lord? Well, I, I go to church on Sunday. Uh, yeah, well, uh, what, what else are you doing? Well, uh, uh, um, and there's nothing there. No purpose, no goal. No, not driven to do anything for God. Friend, I want you to understand that that is, seems to be where much of the church today is and local individual believers who are here but they have no purpose for God. They've not set in on a goal to do something for God. They're not allowing their giftedness to be used by God in the local congregation and in the witnessing outside of the church. Friend, I want you to understand that something is missing in the churches today because there is deficient preaching but secondly because there is deficient power but deficient purpose in the lives of believers but as we look at these deficiencies not only in the book of acts do we see these two deficiencies but thirdly we see deficient power in their lives deficient power you'll see it in chapter 19 verse 11 if you look at chapter 19 verse 11 there uh, and verse 12 and god wrought special miracles by the hands of paul so that from his body were brought unto the sick handkerchiefs or aprons, and the diseases departed from them, and the evil spirits went out unto them. What do we see? We see here that in a minute we'll see that there is deficient power. We see the true power that, that uh, what Paul had here. God was giving extraordinary supernatural miracles as he did in Moses' day, as he did in Elijah and Elisha's day. Why? Because God was getting the attention of the people. The word of God in the New Testament scriptures had not been yet pinned completely down. They were being pinned as these miracles were happening. They didn't have a confirmation and authority for the men of God. How were you supposed to judge a man of God? Because you already had false prophets going around here. God was giving the apostles mighty works of miracles to prove and give evidence to the people. You can trust this man. This is the man of God. Today, aren't you glad that we have the fulfilled, complete scriptures, the written scriptures in our English Bible here, in our King James Bible, we can trust it. We have the authority of God. You can judge me and any other prophet, any other evangelist, any other pastor, any other person in religious work because you have the word of God and you can look at this word and then you can judge that man by it and the message that he has. God was affirming and confirming these through mighty miracles. But we see this great power that was available in that day and time because Paul had it. But look at, uh, look at verse 13 through 14. Uh, then certain of the vagabond Jews, exorcists, took upon them to call over them which had evil spirits in the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, We adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preacheth. Here are some guys who wanted authority and they wanted title. Uh, they, uh, they had a, a religious affiliation with some high people. They seen the great miracles that the apostles were doing. They said, boy, I tell you what, that's pretty good. Everybody's making a big fuss about them. Let's, see if, let's, let's do this. Let's in the flesh do the same work that he's doing in the spirit. We're going to decide that we're going to be able to do this and we're going to do just like he did. We're going to call him up just like he did. And you know what? We're going to say we're going to cast you out, demon, in the name of Jesus that Paul preacheth. 
You better have some Jesus of your own. You start messing in this wicked spiritual world that's out there, friends. I want to tell you that right now. I can tell you firsthand experience. Those that do not understand the wickedness and the power of Satan, you go ahead and step up into something and act like you're bad when you ain't prepared spiritually. I remember years, I'll share this story with you. I remember years ago uh, when I was just a young fella, I was early 20s, I was just back in the church, hot in the church, early 20s, and, and trying to do good, and somebody gave me some, some charismatic CD of Ephesians chapter 6. They did some good preaching, and it was good, good teaching, but they said, boy, you need to claim it and grab hold of you got the power of God. I said, oh, yeah. I remember coming, I remember exactly when I prayed the prayer, God, God just stuck it, glued it in my mind. I was coming right past Harwood's funeral home. I was heading down to North Myrtle Beach to go to work that morning. And uh, I come by Hardwick's and I was in my prayer time with the Lord and I beefed up and bowed up and I did what that Ephesians chapter 6 message said. I said, devil, I commit war against you. That's a good little claim, wasn't it? Boy, I was like a little old Scrappy, Scooby-Doo, you know, Scrappy on Scooby-Doo. I was kind of like Scrappy up there swinging up there going to do something to the devil. I was well-intentioned and we did have the power of heaven, but one thing I didn't realize is that I wasn't spiritually grounded enough to begin to fight. I was in the flesh. And see here, the devil unleashed hell on me. God did as he did Job, it felt like, and he just pulled back a little bit, said, Scrappy, let's see just what you got. And the devil turned loose on me from the time I, right there at Harwood's funeral home until uh, I got to work. All hell broke loose in my life for two weeks. The devil had full reign in my life and I had spiritual warfare like I'd never seen in my life. And finally after two weeks I felt God come back in and nestle me again and push the old devil off. But he taught me a lesson. Be careful. There's access to power. But he that can be trusted in little can be trusted in much. Until you're trusted with little, don't jump on the much. What do we see here? We see that these people were trying to copycat and they called up some people to a guy that was demon possessed and they said in Paul's name and in Jesus' name we're going to cast you out in the flesh. Verse 16, and the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them and came. What did he say? He said, Paul I know, Jesus I know, but you, you should have kept your mouth shut because I'm fitting to wear y'all out right now. You ain't got no spiritual backing up your fleshly walk. And this demon, it's quite funny, God's got to have a, uh, a humor, hasn't he? Because what he does, he takes these boys, this demonic man, and you know that we can see through from Legion in uh, Luke chapter 8 that many times people who are demon-possessed are crazy, they're strong, they can break chains, they're slobbering out in the mouth, they're very strong, and they're, uh, they're just chaotic. And this man, filled with the demon, attacks him, boys, seven head of them, he beats them and they run away whipped up and get this, naked. He stripped every clove off of every one of them. We look and we see that there was deficiency and power in them. There was not in the apostles because they were filled with the Spirit and God was giving them what they needed to fight the warfare which he had placed them in. These in the flesh had tried to pick their place of battle and they had tried to do work in the flesh in other people's names. Friend, there's many things that we can learn from this right here when we think, see the deficiency that, of power that was in even there in the New Testament era First of all, we see that spiritual authority is granted by God, not assumed by man. Spiritual authority is granted by God, not assumed by man. You don't come up and say, God, you're going to give me more today. No, God, God looks and evaluates our life and he sees and it's where we're at and he knows what we can handle at this time in life. God knew at that moment in time in my life, he let all of those things come. When I was just a little old scrappy trying to make, uh, make beef with the devil, he understood where I was at and he built me up and made me stronger with it. And once he brought me through that and taught me a lesson, then he started putting me up in some higher levels. Old Pentecostal saying is, uh, with every level comes a different devil. <laughs> with every step you take up closer to God comes a, another battle, another warfare. And you don't assume where you want to be. You don't assume authority of God like these did. God grants it. 
You yield yourself to God and let Him choose your battles and place you where you need to be spiritually at that time. Spiritual authority is granted by God, not assumed by man. Also, we learn from this, the flesh can imitate the Spirit, but it cannot operate like the Spirit. Boy, they had done pretty good. The flesh was imitating Paul, wasn't it? Boy, they called that man with the demon up here and said, come on up here. Boy, no doubt they had, they had watched the apostles, and um, uh, I'm going to add a little bit here that I think probably was going on. They had seen so much that so they tried to copycat exactly the motions and the movements and even the calling out, the voice, they said, I call this demon out in the name of, uh, of, of Jesus, the God of Paul. And what happened? They imitated everything that had gone on. But they could not operate like the Spirit. Because with the apostles and the Spirit, the demons were coming out. The people were being freed. They were being freed from their bondage. Great picture of salvation there. Someone who is saved by God by the supernatural work being freed from the devil's power. They could not operate because the demon turned on them and whipped them and humiliated them. The flesh cannot achieve spiritual works for God. You need something more. It's got to be more than a decision. It's got to be a yielding to God and allowing God to empower you by the Spirit of God. Not only that, but through this here, when we see the deficient power of these seven sons of Sceva, the authority and power that lies in Jesus' name can only be manifested in and through personal believers of Jesus Christ. What did I say? The authority and power that lies in Jesus' name can only be manifested and used and beneficial by those who know Jesus Christ. What did they do? They used the right name. They used the most powerful name in the world. They used a name that can overachieve and overpower every demonic force in all of this world. And what did it do? It did nothing. Why? Because they did not have their own personal relationship with God to call out the help and assistance of God. Lost people can try to do everything they want to. They can bounce around. They can do the Benny Hinn media coverage and they can flop around like fish on the ground and they can do all of these imitation works. They can call people up, pay people up and pay people to step up out of wheelchairs that were never crippled before and they can imitate all of this stuff but they'll never manifest the true power and work of Almighty God. It's got to be not in grandma's name. It's got, got to be in grandpa's name. Many of us, and I'm glad for the heritage that we have, and I'm thankful for the heritage you've heard me say of a godly mama and a godly grandma. I'm telling you, we are all thankful for that heritage. But friend, what am I telling you? That most of the world today are trying to operate spiritually in what grandma did and what grandpa did. First thing when you ask, are you saved? Do you know Jesus? They begin to talk about what everybody else in their family has been. Yeah, I was raised in church. Yeah, my grandma said say, Grandpa preached. Huh? They wouldn't ask, I wouldn't ask about grandpa. I was asked about you. What do you have? And it's good to, to lift them up and to be challenged to have the same spiritual walk that they had. But friend, I want you to understand, it's not to live in what they did. You need to live in your own spiritual wokeness today. Authority and power of Jesus lies in Jesus in, that lies in Jesus can only be manifested in and through personal believers in Jesus Christ. This power cannot be manifested by someone else's relationship. I'd be like me and you saying, "Boy, I tell you what, come out, devil, in the name of Grandma Pal." Ain't gonna work. Ain't gonna work. I better do it in Jesus' name, and I better do it in my relationship, not someone else's relationship. When we look at this also, when we see the deficient power of these son, seven sons of Sceva, we learn another lesson. They utter Jesus' name. It reminds me of the yells of Samson. Do you remember Samson in the Old Testament? He was probably one of the strongest men ever was. He had great power that God gave him, <clears throat> and his power was in his long hair. And if his long hair ever got cut, he wouldn't have the power anymore. And Samson, he done it just, man, it's just wild. He would kill hundreds of men with the jaw, jawbone of an ass. Donkey, that is. I didn't cuss in the pulpit, okay? He would do, he would just beat and whip up many of those Philistines and do great works. But every time he did, before he did, when they were coming at him, he'd yell. He'd bear down. Ah! And then he'd go precede and whooping some behind. Is that all right to say that? That's not a, a statement of uh, Apollo, says it, great oracle. He would begin to achieve greatly amongst these that were against him. How about that? 
But all of a sudden, after his girlfriend had uh, pulled out of him uh, that his hair was the power, she snuck in and they cut his hair off. He had the power. The power was gone that God had given him. He didn't have no power. But he woke up in the middle of the night and the Philistines were coming against him. What did he do? He said, ah, like he always did. And he went out to fight just like he always did. And what happened? He didn't get the same outcome because the Spirit of God wasn't working with him. But in his mind, he thought he still had the power of God. Friend, I want you to understand today that we need to keep a short account with God. And even though you had the Spirit of God, when sin creeps in, uh, you begin to lose connectivity with God. You grieve the Holy Spirit of God and you don't manifest the same power to the same degree to do the works that God had once given you to do. You can't operate in sin and have the power of God. There's a lot of good people that started well. Even myself as a preacher, I have to keep a short account with God because I do, like you, many times begin to allow sin and separation to creep in sometimes. And if I'm not careful, I'm still trying to do the same things that I used to do in the same power that I used to do it. But then I realized that because the Spirit of God is grieved because of sin in my life, I can holler and yell and do all these things in the flesh, but there is no great spiritual outcome because the flesh cannot produce spiritual works for spirit. These were uttering Jesus' name as Samson did, but it was to no avail. Not only that, we see and understand here that these seven sons uh, were of the chief priest position, great high position, chief priest, positional authority, positional authority in a false religion right then. And what they're doing, they're trying to build on their position and in their family's position within the religious system of that day. But friend, can I just remind you? Position and a positional authority cannot do the works of God. You say you want to be a, a deacon. Well, I tell you what. The position won't make you start doing that work. You'll be doing that work before you get a position. You say you want to be a preacher. And if you just be a preacher, well, are you preaching now? Because if you're not preaching now, the position and title alone is not going to produce preaching in your life. Friend, don't you understand that position cannot achieve spiritual works for the Lord Jesus Christ. Not only that, but we look at verse 16. Look at verse 16 with me. As we see the deficiency of power here. Verse 16, what does it say? These seven sons escaped. It says, And the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them and overcame them and prevailed against them so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. What do we learn here? Fighting in the flesh brings spiritual exhaustion. Fighting in the flesh brings spiritual exhaustion. These men had stepped up and what they were doing, they were in the flesh and what happened? The inner man got wore out. They were exhausted. They were beat. And what did they do? They ran. And what you need to understand is that even though you might be saved by the blood of Jesus Christ and even though you might be well-intentioned in your service to God, if you try to do this work in the flesh, it will wear you out spiritually. And when the body gets tired, it gives up. When the body gets tired and gives up, you start laying out of church, you're done. Friend, what we need to understand is that we need to be fighting not in the flesh, but in the spirit. Look at verse 17 through 20. In verses 17 through 20, and this uh, was known to all the Jews and the Greeks and also dwelling at Ephesus. And people began to Began to, uh, uh, began to be saved by the blood of Jesus. And what we see in this is that we are seeing the spiritual warfare that was going on in Ephesus. What does it say? It says in verse 17, And this was known to all the Jews and Greeks also dwelling in Ephesus, and fear fell on them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. Verse 18, And many that believed came and confessed and showed their deeds. Verse 19, many of them also which used curious arts brought their books together and burned them before all men and they counted the price 
uh, of them and they found 50,000 pieces of silver so mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. This was a wicked place. There was witchcraft everywhere. Everybody had magic arts. They had books that they were studying in. Friend, I want you to understand today that there is a rise of witchcraft in our land. There is a white rise of witchcraft here in Horry County. There are people and young girls claiming themselves as good witches and some as bad witches. Friend, I want to tell you that, friend, I'm going to tell you, you don't need to be associating with no kind of witch or anybody that's up to some kind of curious arts. But what Ephesus was is that it was consumed by the wickedness and the satanic powers that Satan had put in the land. And what I want you to understand here is that even though there was witchcraft in that day, when the gospel came out by people who were now filled and powerful rather than efficient in power, it began to overtake and consume the devil's work in the land. They were getting saved, and what were they getting saved? They were getting saved from the devil, and the things that they held so close to them, they released. The thing that that agitates me most is there's a world of Christians today who want to claim salvation, but they don't want to give anything up. If we were to get people supposedly saved today, many of those would still be holding on to the books and reading them at night too. But truth salvation produces separation and from separation from those things which are wicked in your life. There's a longing for purity. What we're seeing here in Ephesus is that where sin did abound, grace did much more abound, the power of God and the Spirit to manifest works of salvation even in the most wicked's hearts. Satan was and is powerful in sorcery and in witchcraft. The drug use of our day, if you look in the book of Corinthians and it talks about the works of the flesh, it mentions uh, it mentions uh, uh, drug use. It talks about witchcraft. And what it talks about, it uses a Greek word in there that's pharmakia, which is our word for, we get our word pharmacy. And they say that it's witchcraft. I don't know about y'all, but every cartoon you've ever seen, what's a witch always doing? She's always standing over a boiling pot and she's stirring a potion. Friend, I want you to understand that the modern warfare of drug use today is nothing more than the work of Satan, the potion of the devil, and the devil is big and deep in this stuff. But as Moses met with the Egyptian magicians there in the book of Exodus, Moses came forth and there were the Egyptians of black magic. And as he came to them, they tried to copy and imitate the work and power of God by doing the black magic. They succeeded for about three of those plagues. But they couldn't copy them all because God manifested his true power. And just as Moses stood before those Egyptians and overcame them, what I want you to understand today is that we, as the church of the living God, if we begin to operate in the spirit rather than in the flesh, we won't be deficient in power anymore, but we'll begin to see God do a mighty work of changing and transforming. We'll begin to see those who we completely gave up on. Ain't no way they're going to get saved outside of God. We'll begin to see God do work in their lives. And friend, I don't want to be a part of just some, some work, some ongoing meetings. But friend, what I want to be a part of is what we see, the power that can be manifested in our lives. I want to see young people surrender to God and get their lives right. Yeah, get their lives right. Things that are wrong in their lives, get them right. I want to see some, uh, some young men begin to answer the call to preach because they begin to see uh, world gain or serve God. We don't see many answering the call to preach today. Many of them, I think some are being called, but some are just so entangled by the world They're trying to live in the flesh, but not yielding in the spirit. Friend, I want to be a part of a church that people love God and they, uh, as they hear the message of God, they yield themselves to that. They become brokenhearted over their sin. And the only way to do that is not through fleshly preaching and not through the efficient purpose, but it'll be when the people of God take serious the call of God and yield themselves in spirit 
and not just in mind. Every head bowed, every eye closed as we come to a time of altar call. <clears throat> God has spoken, no doubt, to many of us this morning. We all fell and come short of the glory of God. <clears throat> I would say, starting with me this morning, there are none of us who are on the level of spiritual walking with God as we should be and as we could be. I think we all fail. But I'm thankful for a God that regardless of our failures, He's always open. That when we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I'm thankful for a God that doesn't just save us and leave us here to read a book. But He comes into us, He fills us, He comforts us, He empowers us. I'm thankful for a God today that even in the darkest world that seems ever been that his grace is more powerful than the most strongest devil out there today friend maybe you're here today and you've never been saved by the blood of Jesus Christ can I tell you that God is so much better God is so much bigger he can save you this morning if you'll just yield your will to him believe in him if any man shall call upon the name of the Lord he shall be saved friend wouldn't you be saved this morning maybe you're here this morning and you're bound by religion you're so religious, you're like these seven sons of Sceva. You can imitate all day long. You can dress churchy. You can act churchy. You know the language, the lingo. You know the dress. You do it all just right. You could fool the greatest of preachers, possibly even the Apostle Paul if he were here today. But you've never yielded yourself completely to God. Friend, let God do a work in you. Leave the world. Maybe there's some here that have been saved, transformed, and changed. But you've got some of the devil's books still in your house. You've got some of the past sins and the past things that entertained you hanging around your house. Friend, can I tell you the best thing you do is start throwing some stuff out your house. Maybe there's some music in your house that's ungodly. Throw it out. Maybe it's on your iPod. Maybe it's in your phone. Throw it out. Maybe you're seeing pornography on your phone. Get rid of it. Maybe there's, maybe there's some alcohol in your home just tucked away in the back cabinet. We just bring it out every now and then, friend, and get it out your home. You're giving access to the devil to your home, and it's destroying the power that you have. Maybe you're here today, and you've got some relationships that are going on that don't need to be going on. Get it out. Get it gone. Maybe there's some time for you to break up with a boyfriend or girlfriend or maybe it's time for you just to get right and put a ring on it. But friend, today God's got all kinds of things He's telling us this morning. You be obedient as God's leading you. This altar's open and friend, I just tell you the truth, there ain't a one of us probably shouldn't be on this altar giving some things to God this morning and praying that God would give us more power to achieve His work and His will for us as individuals and us as a congregation. Father, in the name of Jesus, help us, Lord. We're weak. God, we're so prone to wonder. None of us are perfect, Lord. God, it's hard to live in the Spirit and tame this old flesh. But God, give us power, will, and want to this morning. God, transform us and give us power to see lost people saved. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we stand and sing, you be obedient. As